Welcome to the Aramir Training Group One meeting. Today is the first meeting of April, April 5th, 2022. So welcome everyone. Looks like we have a little bit of market sell-off going on here. Um, let me pull up uh, this chart. At least we have something to look at. That ought to do. I'm glad I got out of my boxcar trade yesterday. So it was nice to be flat when you have days like this in the market. Um, as, as speaking of the boxcar, um, let's see. Well, there's that pizza page I was talking about. History. So here's how I did. I put it on Thursday and took it off yesterday. Made 3.18% profit on the margin so the equity chart's still going up <laughs> um, i can show you the trade just pull up option view uh, get some where's the one with the chart oh that's this one So let me put it on a, I guess on our charts will be better. Find it Thursday. Thursday was 31st. So I put it on, let's see what time. It went on 11.30, this is my time, so mountain. So 11.30, uh, 31st. <laughs> so right before this drop, that's when I put it on. Pretty good timing. Um, when I put it on, the market was down about oh, 15 or so, something like that. Um, Here. Yeah, there it is. So this is what it would have looked like when I'm starting it out. And you see the market was down about 16. Now let me just get a screenshot of this so I can keep up with the adjustments. Let's put that over here. <laughs> All right, so this was the trade entry. Um, I did a six lot. Um, I like six because it's a perfect number. It can divide it by one, two, or three. Um, you know, if you want to make a really small correction, like I did a leapfrog with one contract. Um, but if you want to take like a third off or a half off, it's uh, no rounding errors. So that's, uh, that's why I like that. Um, and then I try and get the delta around plus one for every credit spread. So or like plus six delta for the whole position. So these are going to be slightly positive delta when you put them on. You can make them negative delta by making the debit spread bigger. And it'll push this expiration line um, below zero. Um, but it's easy to move it up. You, know, you have uh, lots of time to do that. Um, so when Dan starts them out, oftentimes he will put them slightly below zero. Um, but that was the initial one. And then, as you saw on that uh, price chart, as soon as they put it on, the market started tanking. And let's see, 45.86. I'll actually put this. Six. That's about where it was when I put the trade on. And the next adjustment was it. 1247 so you can see the market selling off i have put this wand at where it was at my entry point and you can see the um, this debit spread starting to get at the money 
And then 15 minutes later, we're still down 25. Um, but this has made some money, so I decided to take it off and roll it down a little bit. So this is 45.75. And now it's 45.70. So I rolled it down a little bit. And this expiration line is now slightly above zero. So it's 56. And I'll leave this auto refresh on. Uh, credit spreads are still the same. The delta is uh, under 10, which is good. Um, they start around 10 or uh, 11, something like that. And then we'll go another, actually, and I need to go to the 30 because I did an adjustment at 40, 13, 40. Okay, so now that the market's moved down some more. Um, now it's down 34, and my debit spread is now in the money. So it's time to roll it down. And um, the margin's still about the same, about 12,500. But you can see visually, we're just, uh, um, the, the long strike's just in the money. So we're now at 4570, and now we're going to roll it down to 4555. So we rolled the whole debit spread down 15 points, and now the market's down 44. And uh, we're underwater a little bit, but I mean, the, uh, the trade's still okay. Uh, the short, um, short strike of the credit spread is minus 13 delta. And then I just kept this way. The market closed a half an hour later. And this is where it closed on Thursday, down 70. And I was going to do another roll because you see we're um, 25 points in the money now. In fact, the market's at the short strike of the debit spread. Um, the delta is not too bad. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit more positive than you like, but you know, eight versus six is, isn't terrible. But I didn't have enough time in the day to uh, send out a message to everybody and give them a reasonable chance to get it filled. So I said, well, I'll just do it in the morning. And with those, with the rolling down the debit spread, this expiration line is already at 172 above zero. Um, and the margin is still about the same. So Friday morning, See when the market opened. Well, actually, let me at the opening. So here we are at the open. It's up 13, so it's 43. It's right here. So it's still the debit spread's still in the money, the long strike. So now I roll it down from the 45.55 to. 45 25 so I rolled the debit spread down 30 points and I shortened it up a little bit because the the, the delta is starting to get a little higher the um the strike on the, the short strike on the credit spread is minus 13. I think the, the highest I saw was about 17. so that was 34. okay the next one was uh, three minutes later I adjusted again. 4525. Oh, that's when I leapfrog. I didn't like that the delta being over 10 for the whole position. So I rolled um, this strike down to here just one time. So there was six, now there's one. So this went from a, um, a put credit spread to a put debit spread essentially. Um, and you could see that here where it cut the margin. So if I go back. And then if I use the analyze, you can actually superimpose like previous positions. So this is before the adjustment. And then this is after. And we'll superimpose it. So I'll take some of these lines out. So you can see by that leapfrog, it cuts the delta down. Um, you know, a little bit. It went from like 10 something to 8.7. So it cuts it a little bit, but the reason it's cut is you're cutting the risk. So the max uh, margin down here is, and you can see it, uh, the P and L minus 12.34 thousand. And then versus this one is 91.72. So at the little bump here, the worst case, 
if he's expired exactly here, be minus 10,000. But it's still, you know, he cut $2,500 of risk off of the trade. And when he did that, um, you've also, uh, to, to, to pay for that, you basically uh, um, pushed this expiration line from here, 584 down to 349. So, you know, by, by Dan's guidelines, it was getting close to where I needed to adjust, but it wasn't quite there. But I didn't like that delta being getting close to 11, almost double of kind of the ideal delta. So I decided to do the, um, uh, just leapfrog one. And you can see just one sixth of the position, how it kind of cleans up the uh, uh, the thing. There are different ways you can address this, like uh, just taking off one of these spreads or adding another debit spread, a small one in front of this. Um, the same idea, it's gonna cut your margin and then um, it'll also fix your delta problems at least it'll address the delta problem. And next adjustment was almost nine, so at 45. Now the market starts stabilizing and recovering. Let's see, 45, what did I do? 40, or 857 is the next one. And it looks like I was moving the debit spread. So 45, 25, 45, 5, so 20 wide. And I moved it down another 10 points and for credit. So that um, the, the spread's the same width, so the margin stays the same. But by moving that debit spread down, we lift up this expiration line. So it's up here at 400. And then 10 o'clock was the next one. The market's at 45.34 here. And it sold off a little bit more, but the, the, the debit spread is now um, back at the money. Um, we're still underwater, um, you know, a couple hundred dollars, but on $12,000 of margin, it's still reasonable. Uh, but we want to try and harvest some of this profit that this debit spread just made. So we, uh, let's see, that's on the first. Oh, yeah, here's where we had, um, we rolled the debit spread down again. Again, harvesting some more profit. And then the next adjustment was at 1235. Let's just go to 1230. The market is up down 20 points. So you can see now the market's recovered and our short delta is minus 11, kind of back where we started. And the debit spread's now getting out of the money. So I wanna, um, it's starting to get safer again. It's kind of back within our guidelines. So here's where we, let's see, 1230, 45. Oh yeah, we moved, um, moved this strike down. And again, if you're selling this and buying that, you're selling a higher priced option. So you're uh, um, you're gonna have to do that for a credit, but because you're shortening up the debit spread, this, this is gonna go down. But remember we raised it, so that's actually not a problem. So when we do that, now the risk graph looks like this. So the margins increase just a little bit, like $500. Um, but we did that for credit, so now this expiration line's at 280. And that was at 1245. And I think that was it for the day. So just go to where the market, uh, this is uh, four o'clock Eastern. So now at this point, the market's heading higher and we're kind of up near this expiration line. If you put more lines on here, you can see this is on the 5th, which is today. Um, it's, it's up here. And, you know, if it stays in this area, that's a nice prop potential. So we were in good shape going into, uh, um, into the weekend. Uh, the delta of the um, short strike on the credit spread was minus nine. So it was looking good. And then um, Monday, here's the open on Monday. Uh, Mark is down two, just a little bit. 
you know, trade's doing pretty well as far as profit. Um, and then let's see, 744, 490.95. Debit spread's pretty far out of the money. So we're gonna try and start reducing this. So we rolled this strike up one. And that went from, yeah, so this expiration line now at 389, it was two something, I forget what it said, it was exactly what the, the trade's now up, $230. Then at 822 is the next one, so we'll go right before that. Market's up another seven. And what did I do here? 40, 385, 44, 10. Oh yeah, I started uh, started uh, take some of the trade off. It said in my spreadsheet it said I hit a three percent profit target briefly, so I just took two of these spreads off, and that dropped the margin down the trade. Now, now here you can see that went from like nine thousand down to um, just over five thousand, and this is still about the same, up about three forty, and that's kind of where we kind of where we were. And the market's starting to take off to the upside, but there's not much more juice up here. So, um, and I was coming up on my uh, weekly meeting, so I thought, well, I just you know, we have a three percent profit, so I'll just close it down. So at this point, this is where I just uh, closed everything, and we ended up. Uh, I think the report. Oh, this I gotta wait till it's closed. I guess um, this was right before it was closed. Yeah, 386. And now at nine o'clock, it should be completely closed. And we made $398 on it. So that's kind of how that boxcar worked. Um, but the spreadsheet was very useful for monitoring the uh, risk metrics. You know, the uh, mark to sale ratio, the, the delta, um, all that kind of stuff. Let me see if there's any questions. Um, the boxcar versus the A14. I'm not super familiar with the A14, except I know it does use calendars. Um, I know Dan and I kind of have an affinity towards uh, um, butterflies and vertical spreads, but calendars, not so much. Um, the A14, I know Amy had a really good trade. She said she had a 15% profit on a trade the other day. So you're not going to see that typically on a box car, um, but it's a uh, mathematical trade. It's uh, you know positive expectancy is what you're looking for. Uh, but that's how that's been going. Um, I've been running a, a free call since early March, and that's going to end uh, tomorrow actually. So if people want to follow along with the box car. And you just go to airmirror.com slash boxcar. Put that in the chat. There it is. And that'll take you to this page. And you can see the performance here. Then there's a button down at the bottom to go to, to where you actually sign up. Um, but you can see I have uh, pretty short days in the trade. Typical for this trade is You'll put it on and um, one to four days later, you're out. You know, most of these were just a couple of days. You know, I had one on Friday, I took off on Monday. And then there's still enough time in the week, you put another trade on. I would have done that this week, except the FOMC meeting is coming up. So I didn't want to, uh, you know, that's highlighted here too. So you know, just to remind you that this one's important. Um, so I didn't want to have a trade on going through the FOMC. Um, but it's been working out pretty well. It's a good trade. Dan designed it uh, pretty well. The spreadsheet works great. You can see it's telling me to take profit. If I had stayed in, it, even with today's sell-off, it's still uh, up about the same amount that I made uh, yesterday. So the spreadsheet, uh, it 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 um it's really great for monitoring. Um, I added a few things like this is how far um, the current SPX, ES, and VIX are off their lows, off their highs. 
and in the range between the high and low today, what percentage um, is it? So zero would be at the low, 100% would be at the high. So we're, um, it's pink because it's in the bottom half. And I'll kind of remind you that that's, you know, it's selling off, not going up. And VIX is the other way. So VIX is at 97% of the range today. So it's only six cents off the high. Um, but this is uses Stinkerswim data. I do have plans for integrating this with interactive brokers. Um, I either have to find somebody to help me do it or just go through the API myself. I don't think it's too hard, but I just have to, uh, to do it. But I've been tweaking this. Um, but when we're using this, this shows the mark to sale. Mark is the current price and the sale is what you um, bought or sold it for. And in this case, the, the, um, the credit spread. As long as it stays below like 1.7, there's only nothing to do. Um, and that's when I did that leapfrog, this actually had flashed pink. So it was like 1.65 or 1.7. It was time to address the, uh, this uh, short strike was kind of getting out of control. So that's when I leapfrogged at one. Um, the delta, the, the short strike, once it gets around 17-ish, maybe a little more, 19, that's where you want to maybe do a leapfrog or you know do something to address the position delta is getting too big. And then monitoring the debit spread. When the debit spread has uh, a 10 to 15% profit, which doesn't take much, then uh, you want to harvest that. And kind of the concept is, if you don't harvest it and you know the market goes down, the debit spread makes some money and you don't harvest it, market goes back up. Well, now you've lost that unrealized profit. So if you can harvest some of that money and take the cash out, then if the market reverses, you know the cash isn't going away, you've, you've harvested that. So you wanna try and uh, take money out of that uh, debit spread if possible. And you saw how that lifts up the, um, the expiration uh, line. And it also, uh, it, it does affect the margin. So there's a balance between um, how much do you affect your margin versus how much do you harvest versus what's this doing to your position delta. And then once it gets to a 20% loss, that's uh, that all flash red. And because you don't want to let these debit spreads lose too much money. You know, it's okay to lose a little bit it's protecting you on the downside but if the market starts rallying up you know you got to do something you don't want to just leave it on and have it lose 100 percent and we keep track of all the closed contracts down here with the net p l so that's um that's calculating so for instance on this put debit spread column if you have um, a spread here and you're rolling up both of them i just copy these down here and replace with the new ones and then it's all kind of reset. You don't need anything in this column. But if you're rolling one of the strikes, so one of the, like say this one's the original one and this one's like 44.85, you roll it up to 44.90 then 44.95. Well now you've got two strikes that were with this one, but now they're gone, they're down here, but they still have to be associated with the spread. So that's why this column um, pulls in the p l from those options that used to be with this one. And then that gives you the, the total p l for your debit spread. So that's um, basically how that monitoring works. Um, I really like this put chain. This is how we help find the, um, the next uh, trade to do. So for instance, if we were going to put one on for Thursday expiration. Now, Friday is Good Friday, the 15th, so the market's closed. So this is like a Friday next week. So you're nine days out. We look at Think or Swim for the, oh yeah, it is on the 14th. 18.6 volatility. And we're looking for minus 1.3 to 1.5 standard deviation, that range. And then what this coloring is, so in the top 40, and you can define how many you want. I just use 40. It finds the median, half, half below, half above. And then if these values, the actual values are above the median, it's a light green. If it's above three times, it's a dark green. So you can see where the heavily traded uh, strikes are. Um, but this 1.3 to 1.5 standard deviations, there's one standard deviation below the market. 
end up being these stripes. So these kind of olive color. And it generally is, is around 10, 12 delta, so that looks about right. Um, but you want to try and find a strike that's traded. So, you know, you may go down to this because there's enough premium and it's heavily traded. So the 43.50. So I'd probably take this one. You'd like to get more than one and a half standard deviations if you can. And there's plenty of premium and that's heavily traded. So that would be a good one to pick. Um, but uh, you can, well, that's a 35 wide, actually, you want a 25 wide. So those you'd be getting. This one maybe a little bit, little, not not enough 130. So maybe you would go this 150 uh, with a 10 delta, or possibly this one of these. But oops, don't want to do that. Uh, but you can see you're looking around a dollar fifty, dollar sixty, something like that for your um, for your entry for a credit. And then depends on how many strikes you're trading. You know, say you're doing six then your total credit is whatever this is times six. And then it depends on how many days you have to expiration. Say you have a week, say you want to go a little bit more. That's the maximum you want to pay for your debit spread. So say we're picking this strike, the maximum's like, uh, we're getting a $9 and say 60 cent credit. So we'll just start up here with the 25 wide. If we go even one strike out of the money, uh, we're going to have a small credit for that trade. Um, and you can go farther, say you want to do like a 30 wide. Um, then if you put this one on, you'd have like a 40 cent debit for the for the net. Um, so you can just you know, put whatever width you want here. But this worked great for uh, uh, for entering the trade and you know, figure out what options should I sell and how much am I going to get for it. And even when I'm doing an adjustment, I'll use this. So if I'm going to roll up, say, the 45.35 to 45.40, that five wide, I can look and see, okay, that's trading for $1.90. So that's, I know what price I should put in. So that's, because uh, I have a couple of accounts I trade to interactive brokers that aren't using live data, so it's all delayed. So I use this to look and see, well, what's it really trading for? And then I can put in the right price on my order. Okay, if you have a market crash, um, while you're doing that leapfrogging, let me just pull it up again. Let's see, you go back to the trade entry, I guess. And that was 11.30. Just so we have a visual. I think it was 11.30. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so you're down here around um, uh, one and a half standard deviations, 1.4 or something like that. So a typical market crash, I think you would see like a 2% uh, crash. Um, as long as it doesn't gap down, which it normally does, and it usually um, sells off on the way, you're rolling, 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 and then cutting your deltas by leapfrogging and stuff. But at some point, if you hit a 5% loss, you just got to have to eat it. And that'll happen probably on the first day, probably somewhere around a 1.1 to 1.5% move down, like a gap down. Um, so you can't defend it too much. You're going to have a loss, but you know, you're know you doing one or two a week. Uh, so you should recover it fairly quickly. Um, you have the spreadsheets for the boxcar subscribers. So you've got um, today and tomorrow to uh, to get it. Um, and then uh, I do have updates for it. So <clears throat> basically, when I um, when I put a trade on, like I say, an adjustment, and I adjust the spreadsheet, my monitoring tab. You know, I'll move these down, put in the strikes. Um, and the prices and all that, and even the date timestamp. And I put these in here because then you can sort it. So if you want to sort it by strike, you can say sort it by column A. And I just get rid of this one. And now it's sorted by strike. 
And this helps like an option view if I look at the T log. I can also sort by strike and then filter by trade. Then I can go through each strike and make sure that all my data is correct. Um, and then you can also sort by the date and time. So that would be column E and column F. And that's the order that I actually made the adjustment. Um, so I have like a version here. This is kind of still in development, but it's actually gotten to the point where it's pretty useful. So on the boxcar trade homepage, there's actually a, a tab called spreadsheet that shows the current version and the date time it was updated. If you click on it as a boxcar subscriber, you actually can just click here to download the latest one. It's got a date time stamp on it. So there was a problem because for a while I was naming it the same name, just replacing it with a new version but people's browser was caching that and not actually downloading the new one. So this gets rid of that problem. And then here's the version history. I had it as a tab on here, but it was getting too long. So I just put it on the website. Um, but then on the settings for the boxcar, you can actually, there's a new here, a new update notification for the spreadsheet updated. So when I update it, um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll do an adjustment, update the spreadsheet, and get it up on the website. And any subscriber that's got these checked will get notified that there's a new version. And then all I have to do is go to this page, hit the button, and they've got the updated spreadsheet. And the capital requirement, um, I use uh, um, $2,500 per credit spread. So a six lot would use six, uh, six times 2,500 or, or 15K. Um, now that's on SPX. Um, I have, do have a couple of accounts I'm trading that are pretty small. And I actually got some <clears throat> pattern day trader warnings on them when I was rolling some of these strikes down. So I, uh, I'll probably be doing an ES futures option version for them, um, or maybe spiders. Not really sure which one I'm going to use yet. Um, but I will have one for smaller accounts too. And as far as uh, for the, the multiplier, I think Dan was using 1.1 or 1.2, kind of trader's choice. You know, the farther out you start it, the bigger your multiplier can be because you have more time to adjust. So if you're opening a trade on Thursday for the following Friday expiration, so eight days away, you could go to 1.2, maybe 1.15, Friday, maybe 1.1 or maybe one, and then uh, Monday, um, one or less, maybe 0 0.95, 0 0.9. Um, personally, I like to have the trade start with uh, a slight uh, positive number on the upside. So I always use uh, one or less, but uh, you don't have to. You could start out with, <clears throat> you know, slightly below zero, which will give you uh, a more, uh, a less positive delta. But yeah, it's uh, it's been going pretty well. And even when the market's like this, um, like today, you know, you can see it's still pretty orderly. This is a two minute chart. Um, here's like a two minute chart. This kind of shows the whole range of the day. Here we had a fairly sharp move down, probably a report, um, but then it bounced a little bit and then starts, you know, kind of working its way down. But it, as long as markets are trading, you can adjust them. The only time you're going to really get in problems if it's like an overnight move, like something happens on the weekend and, you know, something really bad, uh, like, like a COVID announcement or something or a war. Um, but, you know, those don't happen very often. So, you know, you'll probably have a loss, but then, you know, you're going to make your three, four, five percent, you know, a couple more times that month. So you probably maybe might not even lose that month. You don't have to have six. I think Dan uses 10. Um, I've seen five. So you can use uh, less uh, contracts if you want. Or like I said, you could trade ES futures options. It's $50 a point versus 100 with the spider. So I would think the margin on ES would be about half. So maybe 1250 per credit spread. So a six lot would cost you about maybe 6,000. Um, and spiders, it's um, you know, one tenth. So 
maybe fifteen hundred dollars instead of fifteen thousand for a spider one. A six lot. And uh, this chart setup actually works pretty well. And I have to thank Wayne for this. Um, I hadn't heard of the ease of movement indicator, but this thing's awesome. Um, basically, if it's above zero, it's easier for the market to go higher. If it's below zero, it's easier for it to go lower. And then I've got these uh, grab candles, um, which are interesting. They actually do a pretty good job. I think Dan uses them too. And then this parabolic um, stop is kind of kind of useful. You know, it's kind of confirming. And then with the RSI. So RSI below 50, ease of movement below zero. These are red. It's not a good sign for the market to go higher. And you can see it's just kind of trending down here. And then these change color, the RSI hit 50, this one above zero. So that looks like the market's trying to recover and it did you know, go up another five points, but it's kind of stable right now. Uh, but when I enter, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the market to see big picture. Here's a daily chart. Uh, how are we doing on the daily chart? We're kind of in consolidation here, it looks like. So it's in a kind of bigger uptrend, but um, you know, is it going to roll over? It hasn't really shown that yet. RSI and ease of movement are still pretty strong. Um, ease of movement does depend on volume, so you have to have something with volume, so either spiders or ES. SPX, this won't show up. Um, and here you see that we just bumped up again. Um, if you try to close the position at the close and reopen it the next day, um, I haven't tried that, but <clears throat> you certainly could. Um, you know, if you have an event like the FOMC, you could close it like an hour before the meeting and then an hour after, you know, after it stabilizes after the meeting announcement, you could put it back on. And you would probably still make money. I don't see why not. Uh, but you definitely want to try and uh, time your entries a little bit. You know, if you see the market's going down like this and VIX is going up or the VIX and your, uh, your indicators like RSI, ease of movement, all that aren't showing that the market's uh, stabilizing, then you probably don't want to enter yet. Uh, but here, yeah, it's, it's rising. So this stuff's all working. So... It's uh, it definitely helps to look at the charts when you're entering to figure out you know, a good entry time. You know, like when it makes a move like this and all these candles are red and um, you know, the market's falling, you want to wait for it to show signs that it's stabilizing. So yeah, Wayne, thanks for showing me this. That's uh, that was really great. I really really appreciate that. I'm glad it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's new with the sleep while and awake? Oh, you know, preserving capital, growing money, you know, that's how it works. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's doing good. We're uh, positioned really well for the current macro environment. We're positioned really nicely for the FOMC announcement. So that's really nice. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's doing great. I guess I could... Uh pull up the history we go to aaronmarie.com slash sleep well yeah if you go to like the home page or yeah there you go right there yeah. um <clears throat> we're still doing very very well against you know 60 40 and risk parity they're all having a really hard time with the current macro environment just because bonds um you know if you pull up bonds man bonds are uh well, bonds are no joke that. let's see which one do you well, want ZB, 30-year, 10-year? You can grab any of them. <laughs> but yeah, sure, grab the 10-year. Uh, the That's probably what most people look at in no, this general. is the yield. So yeah, it's going to work inverse to that. So, so here's the 30-year. Like, this is the 30-year bond. Okay, so yeah, there you go. So that'll actually work in, um, if you were to hold bonds, what they'd be uh, valued at. And this is what over the last couple of months, right? Like if you pull up from the beginning of the year, or a full Let's year. Here's a, yeah. here's a daily. This is, uh, uh, here's 2022. This is this year. 
Yeah, so you can see, like, as the market's corrected this year, it's definitely had a hard time. And that's that's in the 30-year, right? Right. Um, if you pull up a, a closer dated, so like the one-year or the... Um, oh, we have an ETF for that, right? Let's see, TLT. Uh, you can do, uh, well, TLT, that's the 20-year. So, yeah, that'll that's the same thing as far as longer duration. So you can see that longer durations are having issues this year. And if you pull up a shorter duration, which there's an ETF for that too, which is SHY, SHY, I think, SHY. SHY? Yep. There oh, it yeah, is. this one? Okay. Oh, yeah. And That's not looking your, so great, is it? <laughs> yeah, there's your closer dated bonds. So in general, like, you know, these whole this whole 60-40 stock bond portfolio, what's most people's IRAs and 401ks and... Um, what pretty much every, you know, everyone and their mother, uh, you know, registered investment advisor sticks everyone into, right. And they're trying to make their money on like financial planning, quote unquote, and stuff like that. And they don't really pay attention too much to the portfolio anymore. And that's because every financial advisor out there is pretty much just doing the exact same thing. They're just getting market, um, exposure. Because bonds and, are safe, right? <laughs> well, yeah. And like, that's what they, they have. That's what they'll do. They'll sit there and go, well, you know, how old are you or how much can you risk or whatever like that? Or we'll get a target dated fund, quote unquote. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get 4% yield in an inflation environment of seven or 8%, like you're losing 4% a year, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's not a good situation. You're losing 4% purchasing power, I should say. Right. So you need to beat you, inflation. Got, yeah, you've you've got to. Well, and and you know, even something like treasury inflation protected securities, so like tip, um, tip isn't even keeping up with inflation right now, really. So and you can see that, you know, so uh, that's supposed to be following the the CPI. Um, and it's not even doing a really great job at that. So um yeah, it's a really interesting time period. I mean, it's nothing new for macroeconomics. It's nothing new for the sleep well portfolio or the awake. Um, it just is what it is. So yeah, it's it's doing really great. I just uh, I hope that you know people. I, I I've gotten tons of feedback that they've learned a lot from the sleep well portfolio and um, the the weekly comments that I put out. And so that's been really nice to hear that. Um, it's first of all saved people some money and also helped them grow and understand their capital in a long-term manner and that's all i can really hope for so it's it's, it's doing really great um, if we wanted to dig in to man check this out um you've got trading view up right now right yeah yeah uh look at this there's a put this into your we'll do do the us zero two y minus the us zero three my and why my like uh mary, oh, my yeah mary this yield one. okay gotcha check this out this is a really cool chart put it? i'll explain this in just a second uh, where, where did it put it <laughs> it's somewhere down in your list there it is oh i think yep. uh, let's see. uh no that's the... a different one i had let me try oh, it again no. What was it? U.S. Uh, so it is. Let me pull it up really quick. It is the U.S. zero two Y. Zero three M Y. This one minus the U.S. zero three M Y. Yeah. All right. Uh, hopefully, you put it somewhere I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. If it. not, I've got it up. I can pull it up too. All right. Let me. St I I don't know where it is. Um... <laughs> let me pull it up thing. uh where's my control thing oh here we go stop share all right um let me share screen just a second here it's weird i don't know why it didn't show up on my list yeah it's uh it happens i guess you know <laughs> All right, so here's the here's this chart right here. So basically, what we're looking at here is the U.S. the the, the two year bond minus right? the three month minus the three month. Yes, exactly. 
So this is a really important graph right here. And I know it might be like, well, yeah, whatever, right? But the, <laughs> this is this is basically what is happening between the bond market participants, the general bond market participants versus the Fed, right? So the Fed is in these very, very close ex expiration bonds, right? These very, very close maturing bonds. So these three-month bonds, this front end of the yield curve, is a good way to tell, okay, where are they at? And basically you can see that when, uh, well, here, we'll talk about this in just a second, but in the three year, three months, so here we can actually grab this. So here, this is exactly what we're looking at here. So in this blue line here, this is the yield curve, right? And here's the three year that we're grabbing right now, right? And then versus the three month, right? <laughs> so you can see there's quite a big difference right here, right? But this is basically because the front month, the one month, is the one month is the risk-free rate. That's the target rate for the Federal Reserve, right? And in order to maintain that target rate, they have to come out and buy however many bonds it takes to achieve that rate, right? And um, right now, they are having to buy a lot. But how do we know that? Well, that's because back here, this is where the Fed doesn't have a target rate right now, right? So when they don't have a target rate, this is where the bond markets, just normal supply and demand can kind of come in, especially when there's no mortgage-backed security buying or no, there's no manipulation on the back end of the curve right now. So what we're seeing is, is we're seeing this inversion back here, right? Because the bond market actually wants higher yields, 3% 3, 3 or more. They want this inversion, right? Um, but the Federal Reserve isn't allowing it. So they're keeping this artificially suppressed. So what's really neat about that is, if we can think about this, is the Federal Reserve, in order to do this, they have to buy a lot of bonds and a lot more than what the bond market can even absorb, right? So they're just, they're just, they're like full-fledged gully-ho buying every bond they can. Well, the Federal Reserve doesn't make any money, right? So um, in order for them to buy extra securities, they have to print money. And so this is them, uh, you can basically see how much they're printing right now. And this is normally a very, 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 very stimulative effect. Um, so this is kind of neat. And so you can see this like during different times, like when, when did this ever happen? And you know, when did we get inversions? But anyways, we'll go back to this little chart. And so what's nifty about this is you can see here how much the Federal Reserve stimulus, right, um, is right now. And so, you know, um, you can see that we had this back in 94, uh, back in the crash of 01, right? Um, back in the 2008 crash, right? Right before the actually October, like really nastiness. But like right before that, we got up to near the levels that we're at now. And then we're also near at the where levels at now. So this is, in essence, this is the Federal Reserve kind of artificially stimulating um, in a way that normally we only see during very, very, very um, aggressive monetary policy in an economic recession, right? So I think that this is kind of a cool little chart to pay attention to and see how much the Fed is doing this. I'm assuming what they're probably going to do is uh, do something to fix this yield curve, right? So maybe they'll sell some of these securities and buy back some of these securities, some sort of operation twist or something like that, but um, try to push these down, right? Because this an inversion is a, is a challenge. So yeah, that's kind of what's going on in macroeconomic terms. There's a lot of other things, a lot of other moving parts right now, but it's pretty cool. Well, I finally got that chart pulled up found out what I oh, had cool. to do. I had to put the, the exchange in front of the first one. It was TVC colon, and then, and, and then it worked. Oh, interesting. Well, here, I can let you pull it back up, and you can see it from there. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. Get this here. This one. So, and, and this is really, you know, what is, what's the deal behind this, and what's a uh, you know, what's important for your trading, all those types of things. Um, when this started to go up pretty aggressively, I mean, we started to get into these really heavy stimulus moments. Um, you know, you better believe it, the Fed is definitely helping 
trying to help some things out from, you know, coming and just completely crashing down. So it's nice to see that they're still trying to do some sort of monetary stimulus, even though they're talking about tightening and things like that. Um, this is definitely very, very, very far away from tightening. Like they're, they're not anything like what's back in the eighties or anything when the yield curve was inverted. Um, they are not purposely inverting the yield curve. And that's normally what they're, what they do to stop inflation. And in fact, them doing it like this is actually accelerating inflation, but you know, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> so I know even my kids were talking about the inverted yield curve. Um, so what mm. kind of stuff should they pay attention to? Cause they're worried uh, well, about recession so, and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, I mean, we are going through a slowing growth time period right now. So that's one thing, but monetary stimulus can definitely do, um, it can almost create a head fake, right? Where it's not really an issue. Now, um, don't get me wrong, like the market didn't, can definitely fall back down right now and everything like that. But there is a lot of stimulus going on um, from the Federal Reserve. And if it's if it's very different, so uh, here, I'm going to take back the screen, actually, because okay. I'll show you kind of what's talking about this. Because <clears throat> uh, that's a really great question. But of course, I always want to talk about like, hey, how is this... Um, how is this, you know, investable? How can we do something about it or what, what's important about it or anything like that? Um, so we'll go into uh, a yield curve. I really, really do love this site, by the way. So if you don't, if you don't know the site and you're interested in bonds or you're trying to get into like macroeconomics or anything like that, remember just bonds rule the world, right? So um, so anyway, so here's your 10 and twos. That's typically what I pay attention to for yield curve inversion. Um, and then you've got the tens and ones, which are actually still positive, but that's because the Federal Reserve is pushing down this front end. So most people pay attention to the tens and twos because typically they precede a recession, right? Um, and you can see that most of the time that these gray areas, by the way, are recessions. Um, most of the time, the tens and twos precede it, right? So you can see that even before COVID, we started to do that. Now, the, now the thing to note is why they precede a recession, right? Um, and the reason why they precede the recession is because of the Fed, right? Not because of an inversion. If the Fed wasn't around, an inverted yield curve simply just means that bond market participants believe that current inflation is higher than long-term inflation and they demand more yield for the current inflationary environment, right? It doesn't necessarily mean a bad omen, but in macroeconomics times and Keynesian economics, right? The Fed has to respond to high inflations by keeping stable prices. So how they do this is by manipulating um, the free, the, the risk-free interest rate and basically the front end of the yield curve, right? Because um, too high of interest rates creates a deflationary pressure. Um, uh, too low of inflation rates creates an inflationary pressure, right? So, <clears throat> so coming back here, and this is a, probably a great time, is you can see that this inverted back in the 78, right? Coming into the 80s. So let's go look at um, the 80s. And you can see here in 78, they started to invert, but you can see the Federal Reserve. Remember, the Federal Reserve is front here, is up here. Now, back then, they didn't have these issuance um, of the closer ones, but you can look at the one year, right? So they're, 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 they're literally actively tightening monetary policy. They're keeping the interest rates above where the bond's natural rates are, right? If you kind of project the back end of the yield curve forward. And coming in here, as we get further into 2000 uh, or 1980, right, you can say that the Fed is actively tightening. They're trying to slow down inflation um, by doing this. And so you kind of march forward. And then now, once we get uh, pretty high into this point, you can see that they are really, really fighting inflation, right? That was the years that everyone was screaming because they were cranking interest rates to some ungodly level. They were inverting the yield curve. Oh my God, you're being insane. It was going to kill us all. Yeah, you're, you're going you're gonna to kill the economy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's what they were doing back then, right? 
Um, and this is nothing new. They did this actually in the 70s before um, the 74 meltdown, which was like the stagflation time periods. They tried to stop inflation. But remember, when they are stopping inflation and cranking up these yields, it's creating a deflationary pressure. And it's also creating a deleveraging in assets. And that deleveraging in assets can really create a stock market meltdown if, they're, if the Fed goes a little too aggressive, right? And that's basically what you saw in that 50% dive bomb in 1974 was they just over-tightened. Now, let's kind of move forward to another time period that they over-tighten. Um, and like, let's look at like um, uh, uh, 2000, right? You can see here's a fully inverted yield curve. The Federal Reserve is now in front of the rest of the yield curve, right? So you get this in, you get this, um, first you get this, uh, this inversion starts to happen, right? So here's the inversion. Here's the Federal Reserve behind the curve, right? And so you're getting this runaway inflation, right? And then they go, oh no, crap, we're behind the curve. And they ratchet this guy up. And when they start ratcheting it up and they get to an over tighten, they start to create the asset deleveraging, right? And that deleveraging, because any kind of uh, institution that's, uh, that's depending on those risk-free rates, and then also uh, banks have a really hard time making their spread um, because the risk-free rate is above the back end of the curve. And so banks start to have an issue. And so it creates a deleveraging in institutions and financial institutions. Same thing in 2008, we'll see it again. Um, bam, uh, well here, wait, let's, let's get a little bit before that. So here they are over tightening, belly is back down further. So same thing, repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Um, here's, 2000, <clears throat> here's 2018, 2019. They're way higher than where the bond market wants to be, right? The bond market wants inflation down here and wants the, but you can see how aggressively tightening they are. Okay, so now we've gone through that. Now let's look at what's going on today, right? Is the Federal Reserve over tightening right now? No, right? Um, in fact, the Federal Reserve is being extremely, and I mean, extremely accommodative, right? They are stimulating, they are juicing the stallion with steroids and, and adrenaline right now before the race, right? They are not before now coming into this year, when we started to have uh, a slowdown, the Federal Reserve was going to, was supposedly going to act. Um, I was trying to get this uh, front date, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get it. I might be able to get it if I refresh this, hold on. Then I'll get an ad here in just a second, <laughs> probably. Um, all right, so, um, yep, there we go. So if we come back to, you know, even just January, right? Um, that's a very different, you know, November, January, that's a very different yield curve than what we have right now. That's a Federal Reserve isn't being too stimulative because we're not too far behind where the where that kind of the mean slope is. Um, but then once you get into something like this, now the Federal Reserve is, is being very stimulative and they're going to have to ratchet this up pretty quick. Um, if they do, right? By the time they get up here, they're probably going to create a, a liquidity issue inside the banks, um, and then we'll have to deal with that. But um, right now, they've, they've got some things. So right now, really no big concern. I know a lot of people are, are yelling about the inverted yield curve and stuff like that. But um, you know, just like in the 68s time periods and stuff like that, you can get these inversions without the Federal Reserve actually trying to stop inflation at all. Right? The, the Federal Reserve isn't doing anything. They're if they're if they're concerned about the yield curve, um, what they'll do is they'll probably start buying up these later ends and selling these front ends and trying to lift the whole thing higher um, and just ratcheting up interest rates as a whole, um, which will kill the mortgage market. But that that might be what they do. Anyways, so that's kind of what's going on. Uh, what does it mean to trading? What does it mean for things? Um, <clears throat> definitely, the market's going to behave very much like we're in the middle of 2008 or we're in the middle of, um, you know, even, even something to the extent of like uh, bottom of 2000, 
right? Where you start to get these big, huge, vicious rallies, right? Um, and the upside risk is actually now pretty, uh, is pretty high under this situation, which is very different than what most people are talking about, right? Um, I was pretty predominantly bearish at the end of last year. Um, and then uh, here we go, we had this correction and stuff like that. And even in the middle of the correction, it wasn't looking very pretty. But once the yield curve started to push up and the Federal Reserve basically said, hey, we're not going to raise, you know, one percentage point or we're not going to ratchet this up really fast. Um, and they said that they were going to be as slow as they were with only seven interest rates or anything like that. Um, basically, it just means that they're going to be really stimulative and inflation is going to be higher and longer, which is going to make uh, certain assets much better. So it's going to help stocks to the upside. Now, granted, we're still dependent on growth in the economy, which is a different story. Um, and that's going to, that's looking to have a little bit of an issue this, this quarter, uh, this next quarter and this quarter, but, um, but the inflation can really kind of stay behind it. So a situation could be very possible like 1994. So here I'll come back into 1994. So this is a kind of a similar situation where they were um, a little bit artificially suppressing the front end of the yield curve, right? Um, and then you basically had this just rocket ship in stocks for a while because they were so behind um, the yield curve and they just let it kind of keep going. And you can see that they just, um, they tried to stimulate all the way through that. Um, it is a bunch of phony money, um, but at the same time, you know, phony money is still gains in the stock market. It really doesn't matter. So 1994, um, the only difference between 1994 and now is really the, the PE ratio. Stocks are significantly more expensive now than they used to be. Uh, we can see that in um, like... Uh, like a Buffett indicator, something like this, right? This is a really good inclination of just kind of where we are. So I'll scroll down to the basically the good stuff. Um, so back in 1994 area, when they were doing this, we had a significantly cheaper stock market, right? So it had a lot of room to get ballooned up, right? Um, right now we have a very expensive stock market historically, as far as like PE ratios. We did come down a little bit through this correction. So we're kind of like right here in the dot-com era. Um, so inverted yield curve, very stimulative Fed. They're trying to go for some sort of a soft landing of this. So it just might be reducing gains in stocks for a little while, but might necessarily not lead to like an outright crash because they're trying to engineer a softer, uh, a softer economic slowdown. So yeah, there you go. Well, thanks, Wayne. That was a great explanation. Really appreciate thanks. it. Oh, and there was a comment here. The site has some nice animation. Yeah, they're using uh, high charts for their charting. I really like the high charts. It's it's a really great it's a really great site. I, I just love being able to grab it, go back to and say, hey, what's a few times in history? And the Fed does really run. The, the business cycle, right? The, the growth cycle, because there's our economy is based on debt. And so when you drop interest rates and you stimulate and you inflate, you create a leveraging and then vice versa. When you raise interest rates, sell assets, you create a deleveraging and that deleveraging normally comes from deflationary. But if they can attempt to inflate through the deflationary pressures, they might be able to get stocks to just chop sideways for the next three or four years instead of just outright crash. All right, Wayne, I think we're a little over an hour, so we probably need to wrap it up, but uh, great explanation on the yield curve inversion and um, the Fed and what they're doing or not doing. So I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, the sleep well definitely is kicking butt to our par in 6040. And um, yeah, doing a great job there. Uh, boxcar, again, tomorrow's the last day of the free trial. They don't have any open trades because they closed it yesterday, but you're welcome to come look around, grab a copy of the spreadsheet, et cetera. And um, I'll put the link in the, in the recording, but it's just airmere.com slash boxcar. And 
yeah i think uh we need to wrap it up i've got cleaning people coming so i need to go but um again thanks everyone for coming and uh thanks wayne and we will see you all soon thanks <laughs>